And there's not, nothing wrong with having strong ties with your neighbors. That's actually a good thing. The only problem is that since middle of 2014, this region is having some economic problems. And you see this with the GDP. You see the tendency of GDP to go down for, for the GDP rate to go down for most countries. Of course, Russia and Ukraine having very strong recessions, but also the other countries having quite weak GDP. And if your GDP is weak, you're not importing a lot. And that's important for Georgia, of course. But more importantly is that for different reasons, the currency of these countries depreciated against the US dollar, all of them. And you see, this is the starting point. And all of these currencies lost significant amount of value against the US dollar uh, since uh, January 2014. And uh, of course, what does it mean for Georgia? Uh, of course, these problems here have some repercussions on Georgia. Because uh, if all the countries become cheaper, then it's more difficult to sell goods to the countries. And many people will start buying goods from these partners. That means you would have higher imports and lower exports. And if you look at the trade balance, you have here uh, the exports, imports, and this is the trade deficit. And what you see is in the second half of 2014, a huge increase in the trade deficit by 500 million US dollars in half a year. And this is quite a lot for a country with a GDP, depending which year you take, but say about 14 billion dollars. So in half a year, an increase in the trade deficit of 500 million is of course something to worry about. But uh, fortunately, we don't have to worry too much because a market economy always finds a solution to problems. Because this is not the only market here, the markets are interrelated. And if exports go down, of course, people will be supplying less dollars to the, to the market of foreign exchange. And if imports go up, people will ask for more dollars. So on the foreign exchange market, that is the market for US dollars, you will have a huge demand and less supply. And in such a situation, the price goes up. And this is exactly what happened. We saw in Georgia a depreciation of the currency of the Georgian Lari uh, of about 30% in total. And this is the reaction to the trade balance and to the situation in the region. Now, the relation goes not just in one direction, it's not just from the exports and imports to the currency exchange market, but it goes, of course, back. Once you have a depreciated currency, then, of course, it affects exports and imports. And what happened is actually that starting in uh, the first quarter of 15, the imports declined compared to the first quarter of 14. It's important to compare quarter and quarter because you have a high seasonality in the numbers. And in the second quarter, you see also that imports declined a lot. But most importantly, the trade deficit, which is the difference between exports and imports, the trade deficit, it decreased. So the first half of 2014 and the second half of 2014, <coughs> it increased by half hundred million dollars. And in the second quarter, it starts declining. So, uh, and if you look at data from Geostat, uh, they suggest that in the third quarter of 2015, this trade deficit reduction has continued to happen. So that means, of course, that uh, this devaluation or depreciation of the currency has restored some kind of stability. It has uh, reduced the trade deficit, which has become before uh, quite high. So it was effective in rebalancing the external sector of the country. Now, 
there was a lot of discussion if the national bank did the right thing or not. That's normal. In any country, there is a depreciation. Of course, there is a discussion. And a lot of people think you could have done things different. So what did the national bank do? Well, they actually knew. I mean, this is my interpretation. There are representatives from the national bank here. But uh, this is our interpretation of what they did. They knew we have a different situation in the region. This is not something for a few months. This is something that might stay here for a long time. So it doesn't make sense to start to fight against these fundamental forces. So we just let things happen as in a market economy, and we do not intervene a lot in the foreign exchange market. And if you see, uh, the reserves are quite constant, stable. It means that interventions, they did happen, but they were very limited were not huge interventions in the foreign exchange market. Of course, this is not the only possible reaction to the situation. The National Bank could have acted differently. And let's think what would have meant, what could it have done, and what would have been the implications of that. Well, this is too early. <laughs> the implication would have been, of course, they could have filled the gap between demand and supply of dollars by selling dollars. They could have sold dollars, then the lari would have been constant. Of course, the trade deficit would have been huge. And trade deficit is not just uh, external sector, this is of course production. Because if you export less, you import less and more, then of course production goes down. So this would have had an impact on GDP. GDP would have been much lower. And also, it would have cost many jobs. That's quite, uh, quite clear. But uh, that's not the only point. More important is, of course, uh, the National Bank uh, cannot print dollars. They can only print dari. So they cannot intervene in the foreign exchange market forever. They have a certain amount of international reserves. And if they intervene, intervene, at some stage, the money is gone. The international reserves are depleted and then they have no dollars anymore to intervene. And what happens then? Then you have the depreciation. So, at best, what the National Bank could have done is to delay the depreciation, but not to stop it, only to delay it. And to delay it to the cost of jobs, of GDP, and of losing international reserves. Okay, you might say, okay, this is all theory and uh, real life, they could have done different, and so on. Okay, and I will show you, or try to show you, this is not theory, this is really uh, concrete stuff, because there is, unfortunately, one national bank that did that mistake in the region, and this is Belarus. Actually, we also work in Belarus, but unfortunately, they didn't want to listen to us on this. Uh, but now, the governor was changed, and the new governor understands this. So, what happened in Belarus? You see, this is the Bila Russian ruble, and this is the Russian ruble. And Belarus is very much tightened to Belarus in economic terms. And the ru Russian ruble started depreciating in July 2014, and you see a very strong depreciation, about 50% Russian ruble. Uh, what did the National Bank of Belarus exactly what I said they could have done here. Say, I don't care, I keep the exchange rate to the dollar fixed. Okay, they did it, they did it, they did it, they did it, and then what happened? They find out it's not possible to keep it, and then depreciate it at once, very strongly. Uh, so they were not able to, to avoid the depreciation, they only delayed the depreciation, and uh, the numbers of GDP are very bad, and very important, what happened in the same period, this is exactly the same period, with international reserves. They went down for almost 6.5 billion US dollars to uh, a bit more than 4.5. So they burned 1.7 billion US dollars in reserves. For what? For nothing. Yeah. And that's exactly what the National Bank could have done here. But I think you would agree, it would not have been a very good idea. And actually, 
The other thing which is quite interesting is to see what did other bugs do, because in the first chart I have the Larry was not detected. Now we have here the Larry. And if you see, uh, in the region, everyone had to depreciate because the conditions got worse, the Xana conditions. Some more, Ukraine and, and, and Russia, because gas, uh, the price of oil and because of the conflict in, in Ukraine. Some a bit less, but uh, here you see that actually the Larry is exactly in the middle ground. Everyone had to depreciate. Uh, also, the Larry has depreciated. But it is a completely normal reaction to problems which happen. It would be very strange if the Larry would be here now. Then you would ask, why are you there? Yeah. So uh, we think that from a pure economic point of view, uh, the depreciation was absolutely necessary because without a depreciation, the country would have lost its international reserves, which are very important. And we think also that it was effective because we had a problem, or Georgia had a problem, problem with the external sector. The currency depreciated and the problem was solved. Yeah. And actually, a depreciation is not per se a, a negative thing. A depreciation was here a positive thing because it restored stability. Of course, you might say yes, but I have some money, I borrow some money in dollars and so on. Okay, this is a different topic. This is the fact that the country is, has a quite strong financial dollarization. So and many people took loans in dollars. And if these have depreciation, of course, it becomes quite difficult to pay this money back. Okay, but this is a different topic. And here we have to emphasize that whenever there's a depreciation in a dollarized economy, wherever it's here or in Ukraine or in South America, it doesn't matter, it's always the same. There are winners and losers. Some people win from the depreciation, some people lose. And of course the losers become very angry because they lost money. And they start lobbying. Say, look, uh, someone is doing something wrong. You could ask him, why did you take a loan in, in dollars before? But that's not the problem. They want the money back somehow. But you cannot change the whole policy of a country and, and, and create problems on GDP, on jobs and on production just to avoid some problems of, of people. And we think there are solutions to these problems uh, of US debtors, people who borrowed in US dollars. They can talk to the bank, ask for a restructuring in case they are not able to, to service the debt, extend the maturity, maybe uh, lower payments per month, whatever, there are possibilities for that. And uh, we see no role for the government here. We don't think the government should compensate for people who <coughs> pick up loans in dollars because these are private losses, and private losses should be not socialized. And also, the typical person taking a loan in US dollars, <coughs> these are not the social vulnerable, these are normal people, mediums, medium income, also upper income uh, people who just wanted to, to buy a flat, so uh, this is not really a, a social argument. Many people who uh, take loans are actually quite uh, well off. The final point for us as policy advisors, uh, what does it mean for the future? And I think these events show that the problem is not the depreciation, the problem is the financial dollarization. And, uh, what, of course, the country needs to try to, to pursue is to reduce the use of US dollars or foreign currency in financial contracts. That's the most important thing. And, of course, it is easier said than done because uh, psychology <coughs> plays an important role here. But uh, we know the National Bank has made deep, many steps on that. But I think that after these events, it will become very clear to everyone that this topic is very important for the future, to avoid problems in the future. And of course, we would be happy to support the government and the National Bank with possible steps to try to increase the use of the Larry in the financial sector. Speculation is always an important topic in some countries more than others because of institutional possibilities to speculate. But of course, if you speculate, 
uh, you only speculate if you want, if you have the expectation of winning money. You don't speculate to lose money. Yeah? And uh, the possibility of the speculation exists if the national bank does the wrong decisions. If you prolong the adjustment, if you prolong the adjustment, like it happened in, in Belarus, here at that point, I could have told you, okay, wait a few months and the ruble, the Belarusian ruble, will devalue. That's for sure. Uh, and of course, you can try to make money out of this knowledge. But if the little Russians would have divided immediately, then who will speculate? I mean, you can you can go to the casino and play, but this is a, a very this is 50-50. So the speculation is possible, or there are incentive for speculation if there is a wrong policy. And you mentioned Soros. This was when Great Britain tried to to stay in, in the exchange rate system. And it was clear it was not possible, and that's how speculation worked. But actually, uh, I, I don't see here, in, in the case of Georgia today, uh, a massive uh, role for speculation. And I don't think that the, de the depreciation of the currency is linked to any speculation. There's actually one more thing to be said about uh, this. Is, you asked about the Turkish lira, but you could have just as well asked about the euro. It's not just the Turkish lira or the, or the lira, it's a truly global phenomenon. We have a situation where the dollar is strengthening against pretty much uh, every, every currency in the world. Exactly. And that in itself is also linked to something else, which is the prices of all, all major commodities. I, I, incidentally, I know the price of wheat, so I can tell you precisely what happened for wheat in exactly the same year and a half, from 330 per whatever the unit is, I think it's a bushel, oh, yeah. ton or something, to 170. The, the global price of uh, wheat came down 50%, almost 50%, in the same exactly period. So we, we are looking at a situation where all commodities, oil of course as well, and, uh, yeah. all, all commodities have, have come, come down in dollar, and, and at the same time the dollar goes up. So the dollar, the dollar is more expensive, but everything priced in dollar yeah, yeah. goes down in price. So countries like, like Georgia, like any, any, any other country that imports those commodities, in the end, there was some, so, such a big drop in the prices of commodities. We pay less yeah. now. We pay less for oil and for wheat than we used to pay, even in dollars. So, uh, you know, we look at the lorry price today, if you, if you uh, bought fuel the last uh, few months, we pay less in lorry now for fuel than we used to pay uh, a year and a half ago. So there is no pressure on, on prices, at least not as much as one would have expected, because it's a global phenomenon. If it was something that is Georgia-specific, yeah, exactly, yeah. we would have seen crazy situation. You would, you would have never been able, looking at the National Bank of Georgia, you would have never been able to keep inflation at, at, at the 5% uh, that you have it now. Never ever. But because it's global, because commodity prices came down, yeah, yeah. there's much less pressure. And I think that's a very good point, because <coughs> in the past, I mean, many people really don't like these depreciations because they saw in the past depreciation and then came inflation. Yeah? But this is not happening. So if, if depreciation would lead to a huge inflation, okay, that could be a problem. And that would give a reason for the National Bank to intervene to avoid the inflation, inflation. which is their target. But this is not happening. So, again, as long as the depreciation doesn't hurt the inflation perspectives, it's not a problem. And, again, the euro, I mean, I live in Germany, and, and, and at once it was like 150, 140, now it's 110. So the euro depreciated 25% against the dollar, and people don't know about this. My neighbors, they don't know about this. Because they care how much butter costs and, and bread and the rent and insurance. They don't care about some currency in some uh, very uh, east, uh, country <laughs> yeah, which is uh, miles away. Yeah? Uh, we have two questions here. The uh, hands are raised. Let me ask you something. Uh, concerning taking into consideration that the parameters are there. What are the forecasts and also the 12% uh, that you mentioned in your uh, papers, uh, current account deficit? Is there any point that will be alarming? Uh, the current account deficit is, uh, you have not 
First, the level is always important, of course, you have to look at the level, no question about this. But of course, you have to do uh, which components, what are the reasons for that, is it uh, uh, export, imports, what, what are the sources of this current account deficit, and also what is the financing of it. I mean, what is alarming is if you have a high current account deficit and you are losing reserves. That would mean, look, uh, this is, doesn't work. But of course, if your reserves are stable, it means that somehow your deficit is financed. And then the question is, how do you finance your current account deficit? And if you finance by asking someone, lend me money for, for one day and then I pay you 10%, this is also alarming. But if you have FDI inflows into the country, we would say here for many years, then it's not such a problem. And what we see here is actually that FDI is rather high. So FDI is financing uh, a large share of this uh, trade deficit or current account deficit. And that's why uh, I would not say the topic is not important, but it's not uh, something which you should worry about like, immediately. It's, it's an important topic to look. Uh, I mean, my idea would be try to increase also maybe the savings in the country, because if you have a high national savings, then you need to import this capital. That would be, a, 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 and there are measures how to do that. The solidity of the banking sector is very important for that, a very good supervision. Uh, so these are things which are important to, uh, to, to people to, to, to save more money. But uh, we don't see an urgent need for, for, for action, but a uh, long-term topic. And also do the, sorry, and also do the uh, uh, reserves, the national reserves, they cover three to four months imports. Have you made any research on that? Which is international as far as I know practice? Cover the three months imports. Yeah, uh, well, there, there, there's different criteria about this. Uh, the, the, the well, most well known is the uh, import coverage, three months, but imports are going down now, so it's expected imports, yeah, future imports. Yeah. Uh, not not the, the historical, but uh, so I, I don't know exactly what it's. 3.3 for 2003. 3.3. Yeah, 3.3, 3. Uh, it's. Uh, so it's uh, three months coverage. Uh, the other thing that you should look at, at, at the capital account, of course, financial account, uh, 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 how much uh, it covers of, of uh, short-term debt, that is debt, external debt of, with less of one year maturity. So there are different criteria for that. Uh, of course, it uh, uh, would be nice to have a bit more of reserves. It wouldn't hurt, but uh, and then it would mean the devaluation would be even higher. So I think you have to find the time to, to do that. And, but there is also no acute problem with reserves at the moment. Uh, of course, uh, if there is a possibility to have a bit higher, it would not hurt, for sure. In case of central bank's policy against the exchange rate, as Ricardo already mentioned, our aim is inflation target. Depending on how inflation forecast, it will be higher than our target or lower than the target we will act in terms of the monetary policy, which will have impact in the medium term on the exchange rate as well. So if dollar starts uh, suddenly depreciate, which means that Larry will start to appreciate too fast, which can create uh, deflation in Georgia, which means that we, our impact will grow very fast as well. So we'll have exchange rate will might appreciate now, but it will depreciate later significantly as well. So, which can create lots of problems in the country. So, I will try, try to resist to slow down the passes, which is not uh, expected so far. I think it's it means that based on our forecast, that exchange rate gradually, if there will be no other shock, it might gradually appreciate next year gradually. But if there will be too fast appreciation that we might try to, to, to intervene. As well as, same way as we did in case of depreciation, where on the to fast depreciation, to fast depreciation which was uh, temporarily, and it could create problems in the country, we would intervene. But in 2014, uh, there was a uh, very different, it was long-term shock, and in terms when you have the long-term shock, you cannot stop uh, through intervention. How, how uh, I don't want to steal the show. Maybe take <laughs> the, the, the dollar one. Yeah, um, uh, yeah well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> With the dollar, uh, dollar, 
I think it's uh, well known that Fed announced in 2014 that they will start gradually tapering. They will start gradual easing from um, uh, very uh, eased monetary policy. They will start gradually exiting. And uh, I think the question is for Turkey as well. The first, what we what we have seen in 2013, that uh, currencies like Turkey, India, we saw depreciation because there was some capital outflow from those countries. In Georgia, we don't have lots of uh, uh, portfolio investments, so there was no capital outflow from Georgia. We had some outflow. We had one uh, non-resident investor who used to had uh, 250 million worth of GL securities, he sold and he exited, but there was some other inflow, so it was not visible. So the appreciation of the dollar started in 2013. Then 2014, where there was expectation that Fed will start increase interest rates, the dollar appreciation accelerated. In uh, November, January, dollar index appreciated by about 20%. And uh, Capital outflow, there is some capital outflow from, uh, from Turkey and there are some the leveraging of the large banks and the capital outflow because uh, growth is in Turkey is a little bit slower than it was expected before. There are some internal political pr problems which uh, create additional volatility of the Turkish lira but uh, for the last uh, few days we see that lira is a little bit appreciating which will help uh, Georgian uh, Lari uh, as well. Uh, oil price, which uh, drop of the oil price, which was close to 100 and now around 50, that affected all region, uh, all oil exporting country, and which has a spillover in other countries. So that what happened in Russia, it has a spillover effect to Turkey as well. What happens Azerbaijan has below our effect on Georgia and Armenia and things like that. So it's a global phenomena, dollar appreciation. And there are, and you, in Euro, of course, it, what happens with Euro, it has effect on Georgia as well. In Euro, we have the negative interest rate. So the Central Bank of uh, ECB tries to ease monetary policy as much as they can, which, of course, depreciates the uh, currency. Uh, for the, for the two days after the China crisis, uh, Larry was depreciated 282, I think it was for two days. How did you determine this level, more or less? Uh, you remember, for two days, Larry was to Euro 282. Uh, During the crisis, after the, those uh, events from China, etc. Yeah, we don't uh, intervene in the market. We had only like six interventions in 2000. Uh, 15 or, or maybe less. So the, we have the floating exchange rate. So daily rates are determined by the market. There are fluctuations which are out of our control. We do not try to control it because it's normal to have fluctuation in the exchange rate. So if euro depreciates, Larry appreciates. If euro appreciates, Larry depreciates. It's a cross uh, where there is a cross currency. You presented this whole depreciation as a kind of natural disaster which hit many countries. But as you can see in that graph which we have here, not all countries were hit in the same way, right? I mean, so Ukraine went down really deep, while uh, Georgia just moved yeah. down a little bit. So, um, I mean, there are differences between these countries, particularly in economic policy. So, for example, if a country manages at the same time, to attract a lot of FDI, then this will make the effect less yeah. severe. While if a country chases away its, its investors, the, the opposite will be the case. So I, I, you didn't say anything about the local policy in Georgia, and I'm not talking about monetary policy, I'm talking about economic policy, and about its impact on, on the depreciation. So I would like to know what you think, what the impact yeah, is. But for you, can, if you see longer term uh, graph, you see that the problem of Sharp depreciation is the stability previous years. It was fixed, almost fixed exchange rate, which uh, draw, uh, which created more problem for the economy mm -hmm. in the Ukraine. In terms of the more FDI and more more FD, FDI, it's of course very good and it will help economic growth. But with uh, <coughs> to bring FDI to keep exchange rate or valued, it will not help. So we'll get more FDI and lower growth. So it's not, uh, it's, my point is it's not 
it won't be the best policy. In that case, if we had huge FDI, and if we had exchange rate stable, so probably there will be pressure for us from the public, from the experts, mm -hmm. to intervene to the value. Then, then we have we would have that that problem. Of course, uh, it some problems are I mean less problem or uh, heavier problem or not. But with uh, but my point is that if you had more FDI, depreciation probably will be less. But to keep exchange rate stable with FDI, it's it's won't be possible. And if growth will go down, FDI will go away. So we cannot bring FDI with negative GDP growth. We see the main function of the exchange rate on the current account. I mean, the most important thing for the exchange rate is to balance imports and exports in the current account. That's the, the most important uh, thing. And we look at these shorter uh, events, what happens. Of course, if we take a long-term perspective, of course, we should take into account other factors that explain And maybe very short, uh, companies, some companies try to, to try to soften the, the, the volatility of their uh, share price. Mm -hmm. But the share price of a company has nothing to do with the exchange rate of a country. This is really uh, a, a different logic. And, 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 and the impacts are, are also that the, the share price is a purely financial thing and, and the exchange rate is, is, has a huge impact on the real economy. I mean, the exchange rate, people think about the exchange as something financial, but actually it's crucial for, for, for exports and imports and for production, for jobs. That's why uh, it's very difficult to, to mess around with it. I think we have said it maybe a hundred times that there is no link between the refinancing volumes and exchange rate. The financing volume is a liquidity management instrument. And the depreciation started in November, but the as the increase of refinancing uh, volumes happened in the beginning of the January. Yeah, it's, uh, it was 300 and then became seven, uh, 700 uh, million. Yeah. But it has, uh, so if you look at the money growth, and sometimes uh, people try to use the refinancing, volume of the refinancing to forecast the money growth, then you should look at money aggregates. So what happened with them? With deflation targeting, looking at money aggregates has uh, uh, no value, but still if somebody is poorly monetarist and they should look at the money aggregates, you can see that it's growth of the M1, M2, M3, it's uh, less than 5%. Uh, only cash as it grows it by 8%. So there is no monetary easing which could drive exchange rate to depreciate. But the, the volume of the refinancing is one of the components. We removed liquidity, and the government has removed liquidity from one side, and we supply liquidity from another side. So that is to balance the short-term interest rate. This is uh, for short-term liquidity management. It has nothing to do with, uh, with exchange rate. Yeah. Looks, looks like we have exhausted uh, the interest in, in, in exchange rate policy. I, I would like just to say in conclusion that uh, I've been participating in consultations recently in the Ministry of Economic Development, Economic and Sustainable Development, that's the full name of our ministry. <clears throat> and the topic was actually not so much depreciation, the topic was the possibility of appreciation of, of the lorry and what would be the impact of appreciation going forward on, on the real on the real economy mm -hmm. uh, so there is a, there is an expectation somewhere up there in uh, on the 10th floor of the of that building mm -hmm. that uh, the lorry might actually uh, gain in value and maybe not just the lorry maybe other currencies as well. and again maybe we're looking at the global at the global uh, movement of the of the swing so we'll see. We'll see uh, how things evolve. We recently had an article on our blog um, on this very question of what the future holds. Um, let's see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir.